All right, and we're live. Hey, everyone, and welcome. This is Powerful Content Marketing. It's all about how to plan, create, and leverage your content on landing pages inside of Pardot. We're going to have fun today for those watching the recording. Hello, welcome. We've got a lot of people here live, and uh, the way we like to do things is we have interactive, we have questions that happen throughout. So if you hear me jumping around or answering questions or saying hi to people, it's because we like to do the, the webinar chat and have a good time here. So um, pretend like you're with us. So why are you here? If you're listening to the recording or you're here live, because content marketing is a thing. And we know that content really is the ammo for marketing automation. If it's the ammo, then it's kind of important. Otherwise, what are we doing, right? But we have a lot of marketers who are out there and let me know if you feel the same way if you're here, if you're here live. How do you feel about your content? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you have enough content or don't you have enough content? Go ahead and throw that in the Zoom webinar chat. And while you're doing that, we'll just talk about it. 82% of folks say they don't have enough content. Does that sound familiar? Oh, we have plenty. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, at Chesh, we do have plenty of content. Podcasts will do that for you. Um, does anyone else have too much content or do you have not enough content? Where are you at with the process? And the reason we ask a lot of these questions too, and the reason your answers are important is because that helps us customize the webinar for who's here, right? That way it's more of a one-on-one -on -one and not just like a me, you know, talking to, uh, to everyone. All right. Not only do we not have enough content and some of us have too much, but we have content or not, then guess what? Something close to 70% of content goes unused. It's a number we got doing the podcast. And uh, isn't that crazy? So for those that have too much content, guess what? It's likely that some of that that you spent all that time and all that money on is going unused. Unused. And if you see this Batman joke over here, it actually ties into a, a, a story ar around this crazy content. And by the way, anyone here in this webinar, were you here yesterday? Did anyone catch the webinar on planning your marketing? If you did, go ahead and say hi. Uh, and then I'm going to tell a story you already heard. This is really important. This was a, uh, hey, Steve. Yeah, I remember you from uh, yesterday. Um, there was this piece of content that a company um, that I went to visit created. And the long and the short is they weren't thinking about who it was for. They were just looking about make, creating it. So they end up hiring an attorney in New York City. And they paid him $1,000 an hour to write something like a 27-page white paper. And when I asked them, did it answer any questions of their prospects or did it help, help their buyer make a, a better decision, they kind of – all their heads went down because they realized they didn't create the content. There was no reason or rhyme to it. So we don't want that to happen here. So what we want to talk about here today is – well, we'll get, we'll get to this in a second. What we want to talk about here – and go right here to the – content marketing, we want to talk about how to do content right. We're going to hit that first. And then once we talk through that, just a couple slides because we've got to get cranking here. Then we're going to talk about landing pages, how to make them actually sing and how to make them actually convert. And what are really landing pages? Uh, and if you don't know anything about them, great. If you're an expert on them, we'll still have some powerful things for you. We're going to talk about progressive profiling in Pardot and how to make those landing pages convert as many people as possible. And then finally, we'll, we'll close up. If we have time, we'll try to get through all of this with a path of optimization. So especially for those advanced users, you've got landing pages. How do you make them better? How do you make them convert more people? We're going to get to that next. And if you haven't met me, hey, my name is Casey. Hello. Nice to meet you. Uh, three quick numbers to introduce you to so you understand a little bit more about me. Ten is the number of years I've been working with Pardot. Seems like a long time. It's a decade. And guess what? We're coming up on another decade. So this may be the very last webinar of the decade you join. So I might see you next, next decade. Um, so 10 is that. 2,500 is the number of Pardot implementations that Cheshire Impact has done. Our team is amazing. We're always hiring if, uh, if you're interested. And we also love helping other marketers out and help make them heroes. So that's what we do. The reason I bring up those numbers too is not just to brag like, hey, look at me in my tuxedo, but actually to, to point out that a lot of lessons learned here are from people doing it right people doing it wrong. And we, we want to share all the lessons learned from those experiences. And then finally, Steve, any thoughts? That number went down from yesterday. Does anyone remember what that number is at 228? 
that number. It's a magical number. In every single webinar, you'll see that number decrease. And that's because that is the number of days until I fly to Tanzania to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So that is coming up and I am getting my steps in for sure to prepare for that. So let's get cranking. All right, when and why now? Let's talk real quick. If you haven't heard about this, it's the, the Cheshire Success Index. It's our roadmap for marketing automation. The reason we have this is because we don't just want you to randomly pick different features in Pardot uh, and, and try to set them up because what happens is there's some things that need something to happen before them. And that's why we have them in order. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, all the way through 10. And you'll see the foundation phase has some critical things. It's all about getting to know your buyer and segmenting setting up your ROI tracking so you have first touch, and then really cleaning out your data. Once you have that, you get into phase two. And that's what we're in now on this particular webinar. We're talking about number four, gated content, gated content marketing and making that better. Um, so keep in mind, there are some things you need to do in phase one to make sure you're ready to, to really double down on the gated content. Um, and there are webinars for each one of these things. So. How we do this is not only is it a roadmap, but it's an assessment too. So if you haven't done this yet, I'll, I'll have a chance at the end where you can uh, raise your hand and we can get you the assessment. Um, it only takes 30 minutes. Uh, it's on a phone call with me or someone on the team. And what we do is we ask you a question for each one of these steps, each one of these elements in the CSI. And your answer is either I'm totally doing that, I'm not doing it at all, or I'm kind of doing it. And based on that, you either give yourself a point, you give yourself no point, zero, or half a point. And what this does is by the end of it, you have a score between zero and 10 of how well you're using marketing automation. Cool, right? I think a lot of us have a gut feeling about how well we're, we're using Pardot or whatever tool you're using. But at the end of this, you'll know a number. And it might be two, it might be eight, it might be six, but you'll know where you stand. And the cool thing is you'll know your very next step. So that's the CSI. And today we're on CSI number four. Remember, each one has a question. So today's question, the one that we're trying to answer, but the one that we're trying to give you data and details and strategies and tactics on getting a complete yes to this. Now, you won't have a yes to this at the end of the webinar, but the hope is you get enough tools and inspiration to be able to go hop in your part out account, start building things out so you can say yes for this. So for those joining on the webinar chat, if I were to ask you this question, would you say yes? Would you say no? Would you say kind of? And the question is, do you use gated content to capture leads on your website? And one kind of interesting thing here is we're actually adding chat to that. So if you haven't heard about chat, we're going to have a great webinar coming up next month to talk more about how to use web chat to actually do gated content. So go ahead and let me know in the webinar chat. Yes, no, maybe. I, I see a yes. That's great. That means you get one point for this. Um, and the good news is even if you're a yes for that, there's still some great things we can do on the optimization side. You'll definitely want to see the optimization. And this also lets me know I don't have to spend as much time maybe at the beginning elements. But this is the question. All right. So let's talk planning content real quick. The number one thing you can do is ask your buyers what questions they have, right? Now, this happens in buyer interviews. In CSI number one, we talk all about how to interview your buyer. You may already know the questions they're asking you. They may ask you questions at the trade shows, and they also are always asking sales questions. And what you want to do is throw that in a buyer question map. If you haven't already done this, highly recommend you do this. Um, this is a screenshot straight from the book. And I actually, if you haven't heard about this, I have a book. It's a marketing automation. All the things we talk about here in more depth and detail. And there it is, a little picture of it. Um, and there's a link over at the end, but it's just go.cheshireimpact.com slash book. And it actually goes over to Amazon. So it's over there on Amazon, Amazon Prime. And this comes straight from that. And what this is, is you basically take an index and you start on the left and look at the questions asked column. Every question you've ever been asked by a buyer, you throw it in that column. Eventually, you want to sort it by what stage they're at, what, what stage in the buyer's journey they're at. And we're going to talk about stages next. But you want to go ahead and index all these different questions. And what's really cool about it is you start with the question they ask. And then you want to answer that question. And here's just a quick example. How do I get ROI on my marketing? Well, the quick answer in one sentence to go in the spreadsheet is, well, you set up first touch tracking in Pardot. Okay, cool. Now, the third column is then to decide, well, what's the best way? What kind of content would best describe this or best show this answer? And it 
doesn't necessarily always mean that it's a video. It might be a white paper, a one pager. It might be a book, it might be some other kind of answer. Um, but what this does is gets you thinking, okay, I have a question. I want to answer it. What's the best way to convey that answer? And guess what? This becomes your index of content. So in case you're not sure what content to have, you start with the questions your buyers are asking. You do some quick answers. You decide what kind of way it is to convey them. And then you come up with, you basically have this whole chart that shows you all the content you need to have. And then you can go through and say, well, what content do I have? Do I answer any of these questions with things that I already have? Maybe I have a 27 page white paper and I can chop it up into little pieces and give that to our buyers. But this gives you a real litmus test to understand how you're doing with your content. And this will help you prevent ever having that ever that, that terrible content move that that other company did where they had a 27 page white paper that didn't help anybody. Uh, so this is the way to start. Once you've got those questions in mind, you want to start thinking about their stage. And in this side, you do see stage in the left-hand column. Well, let's talk about it. So there are typical stages you can, you can associate with where someone's at in their buying process. Now, this is kind of a, a, a simplification, but I kind of like starting with the simple, right? So in this case, you have three stages. Start there. If you know particularly you have four or five stages, great, okay? But at least we know there's different kinds of things that are happening in these stages. So let's just talk about them real quick. You got awareness stage, you got consideration, you got decision. Some, some easy examples, and down below, they have this kind of acute, um, you know, sickness type uh, analogy. Um, and so we'll just kind of roll with that. So one is like awareness. Do you know that you have a problem? That's really the question we're asking. And do your buyers know they have a problem? When you're in this stage or before this stage, you don't know. And oftentimes, if you, if you sell tech and um, whatever it is kind of product or service you have, it might be something that solves a problem your buyers don't even know they have. Like, oh, by the way, did you know this is happening with your, your technology? Or guess what? You know, your doctors are getting these things wrong or you're um, losing out on all this investment, all this money or whatever the case may be. Sometimes it's a problem that people don't know they have. Uh, we worked with a, a group out in California who was selling software that helped companies prepare to be audited by software companies. So just in case that they were going to get, Adobe was going to swoop in and tell them they had 3,000 illegal licenses of, of Photoshop, they could say, nope, we checked and we only have 200 licenses and they're all paid for. Here's the documentation, right? It was really helpful. But some companies don't know that as you get bigger and bigger, you may be a target for an investigation to understand if you're actually legally buying software. And these large software companies may come after you. It might be a problem you don't know you have. So awareness is all about getting your buyer to understand they have a problem. Sometimes they have symptoms. You can see the little talking face. Oh, I have a sore, I have a sore throat, a fever, I'm achy all over, but they, I don't know what's wrong with me, right? So maybe they have some symptoms. Maybe they're feeling something to do with what's happening, but they don't know specifically that there's something in particular happening. They just know there's things going on. Um, so getting them to the awareness stage is at least they're, they're recognizing that they have symptoms. Consideration, when they transition over, there's a, a market, like a, a marked location where they essentially start saying, oh, you see in the example, I've got strep throat. Oh, geez, that'd be horrible. I have strep throat. It has a name. There's a thing. It's like, oh, I could get audited by a software company. What are my options for relieving this or curing my symptoms, right? So you see how this type of like question that they're asking, it's more a matter of com com comparison, right? So they understand they've already been aware there's a problem. They know the problem has a name and now they're looking for options. So, so when you ask your buyers questions or you're sorting through that, that question map earlier, you want to start putting them in different categories based on this. So you want to put all your awareness ones at the top, consideration in the middle and decision ones toward the end. And decision ones are a little different. Now it's like, okay, I've decided uh, I've picked an option. I have a couple options here and, um, and now I really want to kind of, get those last minute details figured out that the talking man down here is like, okay, I'm looking at, I'm looking at cost. I'm trying to review um, the doctors and who has good reviews. Really this last one is just kind of those last minute considerations. I don't say consideration, last minute research to make sure you're making the right decision. Right. Um, I want to make sure I don't get fired. 
things like, oh, people never get fired for hiring IBM. All that stuff comes into play in the decision-making phase where they're like, okay, I know I have strep throat. This looks like the best option. Is, is this going to work, right? It's just that last minute. Is this going to work? Am I going to get fired for choosing this option? So consider those stages as people go along. What's cool about this, the work you do here is going to pay off for the next CSI step, which is all about nurturing. So as you create landing pages associated with this content, eventually you go and create nurture campaigns that point at these landing pages. And guess what? They're already planned out and they're already addressing certain stages. Your nurtures can flow right through this. And so that chart, that buyer question map becomes the basis for your nurture campaigns. So you see how the roadmap is helpful because you do a little work here and then you're going to make it so much easier on yourself to do all the other things. It's fantastic. Here's a quick thing. What I did is I went ahead and added some types of content down below here. So you'll see, you know, awareness stage, consideration stage, decision stage. Well, what's the ideal content for each one of these things? Well, blog posts are great for awareness. Why? Because people don't necessarily know it's something's going to happen. Webinars can be good. That can also be mid, mid stage as well. Like you may not know you have a problem with your landing pages, or your content, uh, but you might join a webinar if it's all about maxing out your landing pages and your content, right? Ebooks can be good guides. They're like high level things. Now, when it comes to consideration, remember that the overarching question is who should I go with? What are my options and which one should I choose? Guides come in handy. Comparison charts are great at this point. White papers, somewhat, but not as much. People don't want to do necessarily that much research unless it's a comparison white paper. Reports are great here. Reviews like G2 Crowd and those type of things are fantastic. Now, you'll see some of these vendor comparisons later on here in decision stage. I don't necessarily agree with that. I would put that in the consideration stage. But the case studies is huge for decision stage, right? Because you're trying to say, look, other people have done this before right? Oh, you're going to hire Treasure Impact to help you with part out. Okay, no worries. There's like hundreds of people who have these case studies and they're happy and they're, they would love to talk to you or they have case studies, right? Here you go. Uh, if your software, free trials can help here. Not everyone does that because sometimes they just want people to sign the dotted line and that can be good too. Live demos. Though I would typically put the demos a little earlier. I put those in comparison stage, consideration stage, but it's up to you, right? You chart this thing out you're the expert, you know your, your buyer the most. And, uh, and so you put these things in different places. But these are the mediums. Remember, if we're going back to this chart, the mediums on the right-hand side, consider what's the best way to get this information across. And if somebody's just doing some early information gathering, they may not want to commit to a really long webinar, but they may commit to a, a quick one-pager, or they may commit to like a little video that shows them exactly what they want to do. All right. So we talked content. If you have any questions on content, by the way, you can throw them at the Zoom webinar chat or we're going to have Q&A at the end to really, and we'll stay as long as you want, man. I'll stay all day, all night. We'll talk content, landing pages. So you can send those questions in. And, uh, and if you are in the recording and you're like, man, I wish I could have done that, you can send me an email. It's Casey at CheshireImpact.com, C-A-S-E-Y. Send me, send me your questions at any point and we'll get those answered for you. So now that we've talked about content, and the, the yummy, tasty content that's going to go on things is we want to spice things up a little bit with some landing pages. But the question comes up, what is a landing page? And I had taken this sort of question for granted because I assumed I know what a landing page is, don't you? Sometimes we're unclear on that. Um, but there's this one guy, Brian Massey, he's fantastic. He is the conversion scientist. Uh, I think I will tie you into his podcast in a little bit. I interviewed him on the Hardcore Marketing Show fantastic guy. He constantly is doing testing and optimization of landing pages. And he had a great working definition of a landing page. It's a single-minded page, dead set on keeping the promise made by an ad link or email. And it's to get the visitor to take an action. So it's single-minded. It keeps a promise and it gets them to take an action. So let's just go through those real quick. And you might be thinking, oh, Casey, this is, this is straightforward. This is boring. Um, but actually, you're going to find there's some, some tweaks in here. We're not all doing landing pages the best that we could. We're letting people escape on them usually. And so there's some changes I'm going to bring up here. But this page for sure is single-minded, right? We said single-minded earlier. This page is also single-minded. 
Has anyone been here before? I bet you have, especially as we have holiday shopping coming up right now. Here's an experiment. Next time you're on Amazon, notice this. Hit checkout and then see what happens to Amazon. But actually, before you hit checkout, look at Amazon.com. And what do you see? You can even go there right now. Um, maybe you're doing your Christmas shopping during a webinar. Totally cool. So you're on Amazon. There's like a thousand navigation buttons, right? This has always been how they do things. They, it's just, there's like millions of things you can click on. It's crazy. It's almost overwhelming. But the moment you say checkout, their story changes. Their story changes to what you see here, which is there is no place we want you to go. That logo isn't even clickable. There's no navigation. We don't want you to go anywhere. All we want you to do is what? Click on that yellow button over there. That button that is a different color than anything else on the page here. Click on that big place your order button and make this happen. That's all we want you to do. That is single-minded. So I know this is a B2C example, but consider, do your landing pages have that same kind of focus, right? All of our buyers are, are kind of, we're all kind of like cats, right? Like, oh, this, oh, that, oh, this, oh, that. If I didn't have a slide deck in front of me, we might be talking about multi-touch tracking right now. So it's helpful that your landing pages are singularly focused and they, they get people to do what? Convert, to get captured, to become a lead. When you consider that approach, you're going to get a lot more conversions and a lot more leads in there. Here's a great example, Salesforce. We all know them, right? Is this page single foot? Does that, is it single-minded with a single purpose? Yeah. There's this, looks like a Salesforce IQ, five reasons to grow your business. Fantastic. Blah, blah, blah. Download our ebook. Cool. Here's a form. Now, that form's a little long for my taste, but this page, I mean, I don't even see navigation on this. I don't know if it was clipped out, but I, I don't see anything other than get this thing by giving us this information. Download now. Now, I might have changed that button color. Other than that, it's very single-minded. And, you know, one of the things to bring up, are you a poker champion? Does there, is everyone really good at poker here, by the way? If you are in Zoom webinar chat, let me know so that I know not to play you uh, if we ever meet up or get coffee. Um, Uh-oh, we, we already got some. Uh, good to know. I'll give you my money, and you can, you can play with it and bet, and, uh, and I will watch and cheer. Cheer you all on. So um, a friend of mine named Sean McCarthy had a chance to interview on the podcast, is a poker champion. He routinely wins tournaments. And I thought I was fantastic at poker until I talked to him and learned what strategy he had behind the scenes. And the reason I bring him up is because he is also an AdWords and a landing page champion. He's really good at both of these things. And when we were talking about poker, he said, you know, my thought was, if I have a good hand, I go, oh, I, I think I have a good hand. I should pretend like I don't. That's it, right? Very, very surface level. Sean goes, well, um, the last time, the last eight times Casey had a good hand, he he acted like this when we were playing. And the, the last you know, eight times he had a bad hand, he acted like this. And right now he's acting like this. And he, the percent chance of him having a good hand is this. And my percent chance of having a good hand is this, right? All the math, all the numbers, all the metrics. And it's all about getting down to the nitty gritty. So that's the same kind of logic that allows you to win at AdWords. And when it comes to AdWords or to win at landing pages, when it comes to landing pages, remember we talked about keeping your promises? Well, and this is something I learned from Sean. If your ad says, learn a language for fun, your landing page better say language learning and something to do with fun, right? A lot of times what people will do is they'll have an ad and they'll say whatever it says and goes to the homepage. Homepage is not what you promised them. You promised them learning a language that was fun. Now, let's say you, you promise them learning a language that's fun, and they get to a landing page that just says learning a language. You haven't kept your promise completely, right? Why? Because you had said specifically because it's fun. Now, there are other people trying to learn a language that want to learn it fast. And there are other people that are trying to learn a language that want to do it for free or you know, to, for travel. There's all kinds of purposes and, and promises that you can – stimulate on these ads and the, the point is you want that to be followed through on your landing page now maybe your landing page doesn't uh you know people aren't getting to it from an ad maybe it's just a call out on your website you have part of your website maybe it's your home page like if you go to treasureimpact.com we have an offer it says hey learn about email deliverability you get the white paper here right get the get our research report right on our home page 
if you get to that landing page afterward and it says like something completely different or it's not exactly what you asked for, then you're going to see people falling off the bandwagon. Not everyone's going to convert. So the way to get everyone or as many people to convert as possible is you, you have a promise that attracts people and you keep it through every single step. And you can see on this checklist, let's say this is going back to like a Google ad kind of campaign. Um, you can do this for events as well. They search for X, learning a language for free, right? The ad offers help with that. And they click on, oh, free help with lang language learning. Great. They click. They get to a landing page and it says the exact same offer. And yes, that means making multiple landing pages or making things dynamic. But you have to then follow up on that promise. And then if you do, you'll have a conversion. So that's my daughter there, Lizzie. And she's saying, are you going to pinky promise me on this stuff? You got to keep your promises. When you do that, your conversion rates are higher. So remember a landing page was single-minded. You keep your promises and then it's all about driving action. And so let's talk about different actions you might have on a landing page. Part of landing page um, might be on WordPress as well. Complete the purchase. Is that an action? Yeah. See our resources page. Well, that's an action to see our resources page, but there's no real conversion going on here. So that doesn't, we don't, we don't want to see that one on a landing page. What about get the ebook? Yep. Just like Salesforce's example, we want to see that. Or sign up for a demo. That's a good one. What about see our homepage? Nope. That is not a good one. So again, if you have a landing page, you want to have an action oriented around capturing that lead. You don't just want to send them off somewhere. All right. Let's talk magic forms real quick. Magic forms. I love this with Pardot. It's all about converting people. Ah, which one? Who did this? Who was the troublemaker that did this? I, I don't want to call them out but oh i think you can kind of see it it's green down here so an analyst did this <laughs> they're an analyst but man can they not create a good form let's talk about all the terrible things that are wrong with this form and if you have any thoughts what would you do to change up this form right here go ahead and throw it in the zoom webinar chat i will read them out loud and i'll get people's comments on that and you know even just pause it if you're watching the recording and write down, what are the different things you would change here? Are there any fields you could get rid of? Um, what changes would you make to this landing page? Ben, too many initial questions. Too much content. Yeah. And that, that document, I don't know, it doesn't look so good when it's that small down there and just ah, no pizzazz. But yeah, you, I mean, you hit the nail right on the head there. Too many initial questions. Um, wow. Wow. Let's look at them. First name, last name. That makes sense. Email address. Okay. Business phone. Okay. You want my phone number right away. Job title, company name, company address. What are you going to send me a Christmas present? City, state, zip, country. Holy moly. Yeah, that's a good question. Santa's asking, is this an excerpt? Oh, it's only an excerpt. You're right. It says download the excerpt. So I have to give you all this information for a complimentary report excerpt it's not even for the whole report i guess i'd have to pay for that but man you want all these things who's gonna who's gonna go ahead and raise your hand if you actually want would fill this form out um to get this excerpt i'm telling you it's a barter on a landing page and i'm not feeling it where's the where's the beef right this is this is not working too many initial questions on this one they for sure are not getting me filling this thing out and this brings up a great point when we talk about forms, right? So we've talked content. We talked about the promise. We got people interested. They came to our landing pages. We were single-minded, single-minded. And we had this form. If, you, if we go back here, well, let's go back here. It's single-minded, right? They did that right. But man, single-minded. It was such a huge amount of questions. Well, here's a, here's a cool little graphic that kind of just shows the difference. Uh, there's some math at the top. And what we're trying to show here Yes, I know it's nice. Love at first sight here on the right-hand side. But what I'm trying to do is avoid over here. It's like you're asking your prospects to get married to you on the very first form, right? On the very first date, you're saying, let's get married. Um, and worse, you're asking all those embarrassing questions you probably shouldn't ask on a first date. You're, oh, let me, let me what's, your, what's your work address? What's your, your zip? And all these, all these questions, you're like, man, I just want your excerpt. Your excerpt is like four pages. I'm not going to give you my phone number to call me. You're not even giving me the full report. 
So let's avoid these long forms over here. What's crazy, the one we just saw is longer than my example right here. So if you notice in the math here, every time they get rid of some fields, nine, seven, five, the conversion rate goes up. What you'll find is as you get rid of a field, I've seen it anywhere from half a percent all the way up to like 3% per field you get rid of on a form. Every field you get rid of, you're going to increase your convert. More people are going to fill it out the smaller it is. And if you look at some additional math, the cost per lead decreases dramatically because you're getting more people to fill it out. Conversion rate's going up. Your cost per lead's going down. You can get more leads for the same exact amount of money by having a shorter form. So that's the goal. Have a short form, get more leads in the door. Now the question or the challenge is if you get more leads in the door, or, or we want that, right? But if we reduce the number of questions on the field, well, we can't necessarily send it to sales. Maybe sales really needs a zip code or we need that phone number for sure. That makes sense, a phone number for sales. So that's where progressive profiling comes in. Who's done that? On the, on the Zoom webinar chat, who has set up progressive profiling already? If you have, tell me about it. What kind of fields are you hiding? Or if you haven't done it yet, or have you heard of it or not? Go ahead and throw that in the webinar chat. So this is one of my favorite features with Pardot. And when we get to CSI number four, like we are now, this is the time to set it up. And the idea is you have a single form inside of Pardot. It's, these aren't multiple forms. It's actually a single form in Pardot, but you tell the fields on an individual basis when to show up and when not to show up. And so what you do is you have first name in this example right here. And by the way, this is what I recommend, right? If you're going to do progressive profiling, take a screenshot, make it happen, get the recording. This is the layers I recommend you do when you do progressive profiling. So you have a single form that's ready for someone to come back three times. And then you clone that form over and over and over again for all your call to actions. So that way you don't have to keep doing this logic every time. But the whole goal here is you get some information at the beginning. And if they come back and try to get some more content from you know, another piece of content you have, they see the second form. And if they come back the third time, they see the third form. The most important question on that first form, you know, email's nice, first and last name are nice, it's role. We need to ask the role, no, role or some kind of segmentation question. Why? Because I need you to get you to come back. If I now I have to have you fill out a couple forms to get your phone number, I need you to come back and give you another piece of juicy content. So in order to do that, I need to know more about you. So on that first form, you'll always see some kind of segmentation question so I can figure out who, who you are and what kind of juicy content I can send you next. So you'll come back and tell me the second time, you'll tell me your actual company, your phone number, and some kind of qualification question that I'll use for grading and scoring, uh, particularly for grading, for lead grading. So some kind of qualification question, BANT, you know, like maybe the number of seats you have or number of hospital beds, whatever it might be. And then if, if you come back a third time, I'm going to ask you your email again. It's pre-filled, but I'm also going to ask you some more grading questions. But after the second form, you're off to sales because I've got enough information on you. You've interacted twice. Let's go. Progressive profiling, fantastic stuff. Kind of a quick little tech dive into Pardot. So you know, questions are never asked twice. Questions are not repeated in Pardot by default. Don't break that. Don't make it ask the same question over and over again, especially if it already knows the answer. So Pardot by default, and there's a checkbox in there. I don't want to even show you where it is because I don't want you to click on it. But um, you can have a, show, a question always show up every time. And if it's going to always show up, you'll see a little A next to it. You only want that next to email. Email, it's always going to be there. But all these other questions, if I already know what they are, don't ever show it again because I don't want that form to look long. Even if it's pre-filling the data, I don't want it to be as long because people are just going to see that and be like, man, I don't want to go through all this work like we were seeing at that earlier analyst. Um, if you see a C, it's conditional. And this is actually a screenshot of this previous example. So we showed you an example earlier. Here, this is what that form looks like inside of Pardot. We have these initial questions, the role one that I was talking about. These other questions are conditional on the first set being filled out. I think they're actually tied into role. I tie them all in the same field too. So company, phone, CRM do you use, qualification question are all looking at the role. If we know your role, then we're gonna show you these other three. All right, simple as that. 
You can have unlimited layers, but I recommend you plan for three. I also recommend that if you're gonna do a phone number in there, you make sure it's a text field. Why? Because if you make it a number field, Pardot's gonna freak out. It can't handle the dashes and the parentheses and the pluses unless you make it a text field. Also, you don't need to ask location. Never again, Forrester and all those other people on their forms. You don't need to ask it because Pardot will automatically identify it based on IP address. So that can save you two fields right there, or in Forrester's case, three or four, because you don't need to ask all those details. If you're in the US or Canada, it will tell you that it is the state or the province and the country. If you're outside of those, it'll tell you specifically um, what country they're in. I also don't play required games. If you'll notice, everything's required. In this case, company isn't, but I would actually make that required. So that way, people don't have to figure out, oh, am I gonna ask this question or not? Am I gonna answer it or not? I'm only going to have a few questions. They're all required. Just fill them out. All right. This time, if you were the analyst, what would we have? We'd have a shorter form, right? <laughs> First name, last name, email, some kind of segmentation question. And I tell you what, we would probably double or triple the number of people filling this thing out, guaranteed. All right, let's talk about the path for optimization. How to make those landing pages better, some thoughts, some tricks to get you thinking about, and then we can wrap this thing up. All right, the button color. Early on in my marketing career, I tested a lot of different goofy things. And one was that submit button because I thought maybe I'd heard rumors and maybe you've heard rumors too, that there's a certain color out there that um, will convert more people on my form. Now, what I realize now is actually it's the size of the form that's gonna have the biggest impact on that. But there is some truth to be said for the color. Any ideas what the best, most converting color is for a form? Go ahead and throw that in the Zoom webinar chat. Throw your guesses down. Place your bets, people. Put them down in there. Move the chips in the right place. What color converts the best? While you're doing that, let me tell you the story about where I submitted a request. I was an internal agency, and I submitted a request to make a button. Neon, that's a good guess. I might want to try that. I might want to test that. Uh, well, in this particular case, I, had, I was working with a, a company and I wanted to change their button. It looked like this button right here. It's just this gray HTML default button, just kind of gross OG 90s type button. So I, I wanted a red one. I wanted a really big red button, not this in tiny. And this was like, I magnified this. It was in the, like, this little tiny submit button, default HTML button. And my request to the graphics team was, please, give me this gigantic button, like huge button, and I want it to be fire engine red. We've all seen fire engines, right? Well, what did I get back? I got back this. I got back the same exact button, tiny button, and it was shaded red, like someone had just changed the code momentarily. I was not stoked about that, but would you believe it actually converted more people on the form? Because we didn't have time to get a different button, so we tested it the gray one versus just some kind of color. And it actually did remarkably better. And then later on, we went and got a fire engine red one and it, and it was better as well. So it's a trick question for all of those that they were describing what they thought were their favorite colors for these buttons. The trick question is the answer, the all knowing answer. So you never have to test the button again from Brian Massey. He's tested hundreds of colors. The answer is actually any color that's not on the palette of your website. So any color that isn't default, that doesn't match your scheme. So like for this page right here, look, we're kind of good. We got an orange and blue thing going on. Red's not really in the scheme. So that red really stands out, but I might even make that bright red. On my screen, you don't see it, but I have this bright red zoom button for, uh, to stop sharing. And it just, that's the brightest thing on the page. It doesn't match at all. It doesn't hit, fit the design at all, but that would be the, the button that would drive the most conversions. So there you have it. If you learned one thing today, it's you don't have to keep testing buttons because the one that is gonna work the most is the one that does not match the rest of the page. Go fuchsia, that neon guess from earlier, that would work too. Go crazy with the colors. Now, highly recommend you check out Brian. Um, his episode on the Hardcore Marketing Show was fantastic. He actually came on twice because he's so interesting. We have, we have a whole chapter in the book devoted to topics of optimization and testing, uh, thanks to the things we've learned from him. He wears lab coats. He drinks coffee out of beakers. He actually sent me one. 
uh, really cool guy. So show number 39, start there, and then we can go from there. So highly recommend you check him out. One of the things he did, though, is he talked about the hierarchy of testing. Just like we have a hierarchy of things we want to look at with marketing automation and Pardot, he had his own hierarchy of testing. So if you're going to test something, start at one, then two, then three, then four. And the reason you do that is because you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck when you do testing with the, the higher ones, with the ones up top. And then the ones down below, you'll get some change, but the biggest changes in your testing will happen early on at the top. And so definitely check this thing out. Um, uh, fantastic thing. He start, starts at the top and rolls down from there. Hierarchy of testing, it's fantastic. I know there's a lot to it, but really the idea is you start with value prop testing. I know a lot of us, we're going to do like subject line tests in Pardot or maybe some landing page tests in Pardot if you have that right version of Pardot. Um, but it might be like, well, what do I say in that subject line? Well, here's the deal. If you're going to do a, a subject line test, or if you're going to do a landing page test like we're talking about today, the first thing you want to do is talk about the value. And in the value, the, sort of the way we talk about value is how are you specifically going to solve your buyer's problem? That's the value you have to them. So if you're going to modify your landing page, an A versus a B, consider changing the headline to address in a different way the value you're going to solve for someone. Now, that would be one of those things I would have done for that previous excerpt we were looking at earlier on that landing page. Instead of just saying, get this excerpt, it, it, I would want to test two different values that you could get from that excerpt. You know, whatever that topic was, I don't even remember what it was on, but let's say it was on like AI. It could be something like AI reducing costs per lead acquisition or AI impacting um, return on marketing investment. Ooh. I'd test those two values out, see which one called to my visitor more, see which one converted my visitor more, right? So that'd be a value prop test. You'd want to start with those type of things. And then you move to layout, optimizing the way the page looks, different forms and feels and the way that goes. Um, and then credibility, talking about, you know, can you trust us? And think about this. This actually reflects the buyer journey too, right? We're talking about the awareness, we're getting the credibility, helping people understand who they should choose. Finally, at the end, social proof, trust. Don't worry, we're not going to take your data. We're not going to steal your, your credit card. We're not going to take, take over your Netflix account when you're least expecting it. Um, no, right? So here's the things you should test. All right. Let's talk resources real quick. If you don't already have a CSI number, if you don't know what your score is on the CSI, all you have to do is shoot me an email, casey at cheshireimpact.com, or even easier, you can just say CSI in the Q&A interface or the webinar chat. What we'll do is we'll reach out, we'll schedule it with you. It's called either me or someone on the team, and we go through the different questions. Okay, yep, I see you. And what we do is we go through the different questions. It takes about 30 minutes, and at the end of it, you'll have a score between 0 and 10 of where you're at. You'll also know your very next step because the way we do that is – your earliest number in the CSI that's incomplete, like it could be a 0.5 or a zero, that's where we want you to start. Then if we're working with you, it, may, it doesn't even matter if you're working with us or not, but if you're working with us, those are the things, that's the path we're going to follow. So if, we're, if we've got some free time in that month, we're going to say, hey, how about we go work on CSI number two? That's the, that's the earliest one that you have incomplete. If we can nail that, it'll make all the other steps easier. Finally, you'll know what a 10 looks like. I want to get everyone here to a 10 because then your product account is like practically on fire, converting people left and right. So that's the goal. A couple of things, podcasts. If you haven't heard podcasts before, here are the two ones to start on. The Hardcore Marketing Show, that's my show. And that's basically interviews with some amazing marketers. And we just chat, we learn strategy. Hey, what's your approach to this? How did you become a CMO? How did you become a VP of marketing? Uh, what are your tips for others, others in the marketing world? Also authors, VIPs, and just interview some great, smart people. Much more conversational. Now, Pardot Life Hacks for all of those on Pardot. Definitely check this one out. Jen does that. You can see her here. She spends so much time preparing. This is a tech deep dive. So if you want to get a deep dive on tech, she's doing a series right now on the different Salesforce objects and how they tie into Pardot objects. She did an earlier series of podcasts on Connected Campaign. If you haven't set that up, check that out. So though these both are on YouTube, if you want to see faces and video, uh, and sometimes Jen will uh, share her screen. They're also on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, all those different things. So check those out. Finally, the book. If you, if you haven't thought of a Christmas present, here's one. 
go grab the book. Um, it's actually quickly rising in the ranks and is going to be the most popular, most searched for book in the B2B marketing space shortly. So very excited. It's on pre-order right now. It will be in print by January 14th on Amazon, but you can still get it. And right now it's on Amazon Prime. So let me know how that is. We're going to have some contests with it too. So if you do get it, we're going to have some contests. I can take a picture of the book and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, it also dives in deeper into all the things we talk about in these webinars that we don't have a chance to talk about. So with that, Cheshire Impact, if you haven't met us, we help with Pardot, we help with marketing automation and with Salesforce. So if you have some question or challenge that has nothing to do with Pardot, we're still happy to help. And uh, all you have to do is reach out. You can reply to the email you got or send me an email at Casey at CheshireImpact.com. And we can just talk about it, whether it's building reports on Salesforce or helping you get some new templates for the new year in Pardot. We're just happy to help. And with that, we are done. So we'll hit end to recording. Say goodbye to all of you listening and do some Q&A.